Hello. How are you? How are you? I'm good. Great. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, thank you for having me. Um, I'm really excited to talk to you and especially being a male, a guy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And the thing is, I actually haven't had a lot of live chats with male dancers. And I think that it's so important. There's no doubt that nutrition and even body image, I think impacts all dancers. Yeah, I completely agree. I think I have definitely experienced my own body dysmorphia. Yeah. And I think a lot of men do. I think yeah. a lot of men younger boys especially um are embarrassed to talk about that um so i think that the more we create these conversations that you have with dancers the more open and um less afraid <laughs> they are yeah. to even ask for help yeah and one thing that i've noticed just as the industry has been making some movement over the past, let's say like five years on, you know, when it comes to body image and nutrition, and obviously the industry has a long way to go, but I definitely think that um, there is less conversations when it comes to male dancers and body image than there are when it comes to female dancers, right? So I think that it's even more so important to have these conversations. Yeah, most definitely. Mm -hmm. I agree. So Jim, you're obviously the expert of yourself. I'd love for you to kind of just give us an introduction um, and how you really became from this pre-professional dancer to a professional where you're at now at Ballet Met. Of course. I Well, thanks for asking. I started <laughs> um, because of my older sister who was dancing mm -hmm. at the time. I went to a local dance studio, did jazz, tap, ballet, lyrical modern a little bit all that and then I decided to get um, some more better formal training so I didn't necessarily really want to be a ballet dancer I went to the Draper Center in Rochester New York which is the uh, official school of the Rochester City Ballet and then it opened my eyes up to this whole new world um, and then I went to Houston Ballet um, mm -hmm. at 18 and I was there for eight years and I needed a little bit of a break. I got a little burnt out. I was kind of injured. Mm. Took two years off from the ballet world. Um, moved to LA, did So You Think You Can, well, did So You Think You Can Dance, did the tour, moved to LA, decided I missed ballet. And then mm -hmm. now here I am with Ballet Met. So. <laughs> yeah, I'm so curious, actually, to hear about the differences between those two worlds and uh, being in that ballet world versus being in L.A. So you think you could dance. T talk to us about the differences. I mean, I give so much credit and commend all of the dancers in L.A. and New York. It's such a hustle. It's such mm -hmm. a different mentality and it's such a grind. You have to constantly be your own teacher and motivator. <laughs> Tell yourself to get to class. You know, there's not class provided. Yeah. You have um, something coming up. What, it, uh, for instance, a nutcracker guesting, right? You have to give yourself class. You have to find mm -hmm. time for rehearsal for yourself. But no one is telling you to do that. Um, you're also auditioning. You're also maybe traveling to teach on the side. It's a nonstop process. And it was really exciting and really fun. But I think that my heart was always in the structured company life and, yeah. and ballet. So, mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. I remember when I was in that pre-professional world dancing full time, um, I had received an acceptance into like a full uh, full-time school year program for ballet. And I remember I, I didn't accept it actually. That was kind of when I kind of burnt out of ballet and decided to study nutrition. Uh, but I remember thinking in my head and telling the instructor instructors at that school being like, no, it's okay. I don't need this. I'll be in Manhattan. I can motivate myself to go take, go to steps every day, go take class. And then like when it actually came time to do that, it was really hard and I <laughs> wasn't wasn't as good as I thought I would be at like motivating myself and being my own uh you know to do your own rehearsals and take your own class it's that grind culture is really really tough yeah I couldn't agree more I you know um 
there were moments, and I'm sure you experienced this, where you were really in it. And then there were moments where three months out, you were just giving yourself excuses of, well, I'm doing this on the side, or I'm busy, and I don't have time, or whatever it was. Um, So, you know, back when you have more of a structure, they are providing you, obviously, with class and things, and you have your day set up for you. It's all right there. So the excuses aren't as hard to reach for. (laughs) Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. So as you know, a lot of dance students more in that pre-professional world struggle with a lot of obstacles along the way uh, to that career, that professional dance career. I'm curious to hear from you. What are some specific struggles that you had to deal with as a younger dancer, as a younger male dancer, and how you were able to overcome those struggles or how they're still maybe impacting you? Of course. Two that stick out for me are my height. I'm only 5'6". Um, I'm full. I'm 32 years old, so I, I think I'm fully grown. <laughs> um, <laughs> but when I was even 17, 16, 15, I, I, I think I was probably smaller. I think I was maybe even like 5'4", right? 5'3". Mm-hmm. Um, so my height was always an issue, but I was prepared for that because a lot of my coaches had told me that. Um, but they also had told me that every ballet company has their short dancer. Mm. Um, they have the one that has to be a gesture, yeah. the puck, the puck um, mm. things like that. So that motivated me. Um, and it's something that I still um, am working on, but mm-hmm. also being at this age, um, accepting and realizing the things that I do bring to the table as a shorter dancer are things, number one, I really love. I love moving fast. I love yeah. playing the sidekick to the principal, yeah. mischievous, mm-hmm. um, and embracing that and really um, not being defeated by maybe being shorter, but celebrating that. And then, um, you know, and then occasionally you are giving more than neoclassical contemporary things, a, a more lead opportunity Mm -hmm. but that's something that's definitely hard I think I get a lot of messages asking about that um especially as a male dancer because and then tutu the girl a tutu ballet of course right the girl on point the guy has to it can't be the same height he has Mm -hmm. to be a good head taller aesthetically too right um but again I think I tell my students everyone especially in big companies everyone bring something different to the table. And the reason why you do these full length ballets and have a Roth bar and have a this and a that is because it's a story ballet that with all these different types of um, characters, right? And that's what's really special, I think, about being a part of a, a really big company or now even a small company, but we still do full length ballets, right? Yeah. Um, and not fix, not getting too fixated on what you don't get to do, but the things that you are cast for, really putting 110% into that. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, I think the grass is, I also tell my students the grass is always greener because some of the taller dancers want to move fast and get to do those other roles and they don't get those opportunities, right? So it's a constant battle of navigating how that whole <laughs> world mm-hmm. works and casting and I think because the career is so short, we get really like, um, uh, like almost stressed about it because we want to fulfill so many things before we're done. Yeah. Um, But just now sitting in that moment and enjoying the things that you really get to do and um, get to be cast as is really important. Oh, that is so important. I mean, what I, something that I'm always working on with the dancers that I work with is appreciation and how can we see what we do have and what we are bringing to the stage exactly what you're talking about and how can we utilize that tool of appreciation sometimes for dancers who are struggling with body image um, it might be really tough to find a place of like full-blown acceptance and I think what's really interesting with what you're saying is uh, we sometimes have this mindset of the grass is always greener on the other side so it's like do we ever reach that full acceptance and if we don't there's appreciation that we can turn to and and tune into that. Yeah, no, it's it's so interesting. I had a conversation with a friend of mine who is a really great partner, right? And 
he was like, I trained to be a dancer as well. And the only times I get to be on stage is when I'm behind a girl. Mm. And then I'm on, I'm on the other side being like, oh, I want to do more positive work, but I don't have a girl small enough or right. just, I'm just not given those opportunities. Um, so yeah, it's, I, like you said, it's, it's so interesting. <laughs> I still haven't really figured that out or have a really great answer to always, yeah. you know, tell a student that's just, you know, but yeah. Absolutely. Was there ever a point, a specific point that you can think about when maybe you started to think about food and what the impact of how you were fueling your body, how that ended up yes. impacting you on stage? Yes. So I was injured I was dealing with an ankle injury off and on for a really long time I then finally had I was on tour and I remember we were overseas and at that time I could barely even like walk on my foot and I came mm. back and I was like I need to you know take it to the next step and finally had surgery I came back too soon. I was off for about 10 months-ish, mm. and then I came back too soon. I was really excited because I was getting to do, like, puck in the summer or something, and then re-injured myself, and then was out for another, like, six months, and I had talked to a nutritionist, and that's when I kind of had shifted what I needed for my body, for recovery, especially your body's really smart, right? It knows when it's needing extra um nutrition and to recover and I you know I realized the things that I was putting into my body and calorie intake and I, I, and also cross training was really a new concept to me because um again we you know wouldn't really talk about that or I don't you know actually I don't even know if we had a nutritionist on on site I think I went somewhere um yeah. but it, it did create a mind shift of how I mean it's such a cliche thing to say but you know how they were like your your body's your instrument and how you yeah. take care of it but mm -hmm. especially going through something that um was such a lengthy injury made me really focus on the lifestyle of, I guess, what I was putting into my body, but also being and having sustainable energy throughout my days, throughout my nutcracker seasons, um, and to have longevity as a dancer and as a human. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And, and that so. is so important. A lot of dancers, I think, are, for lack of a better phrase, slapped in the face when they get in injured. Yes. Right. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, and the role that food can play, because our body is our instrument or our tool, and the role that food can play, and even not just food. I love that you mentioned cross training because that does play a huge role in helping us, you know, figure out different aspects of, of how we can move our body and without injuring it or re-injuring it. Yes, and you know, as such, everyone's has their own personal relationship with food, and yeah. everyone's body is different. And I want. It's hard because um, I don't think you should deprive yourself of things. I think cravings are natural, and I think that moderation is sometimes the key. Um, and, and yeah, and it's still I still try um, to navigate that in a way, especially during my seasons of really intense um, performances. But then also when I'm off season, right? Um, so. It's hard because I'm not going to sit here and be like, oh, I, you know, in the mornings I do this all the time and I always have my smoothie and I eat only, you know, because yeah, I'll, I'll treat myself to pizza when I, you know, or I'll, you know, so I'm, it's, I think that balance I have learned is for me personally is really important because as soon as I deprive myself from like, it's not good for me, I'm not going to have that. It's, that's where it gets a little um, difficult. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, you know, one thing that you said that I loved was our bodies are smart. And cravings, another thing that you said, are literally our body talking to us or yelling at us and saying what it needs. And so often those cravings are born from those restrictions. As soon as when we tell ourselves, like, oh, we shouldn't be eating this or this is bad, that's when you get into that 
sticky territory and then those cravings start to come along because another thing I always say to kind of bring back that phrase of the grass is always greener on the other side. When we think we can have something, we're always going to be thinking about it and, and wanting that. Yes. Or we end up like on the weekends or on a day or as soon as we're off season on a break binge eating almost. I mean, again, not, yeah. that's not everyone, mm -hmm. um, but that's definitely has happened to me where I'm like, oh, yeah. I'm on Nutcracker is done. This is my two week break and I eat really poorly and I come yeah. back and I'm like, oh, my body is not great because I just I had just made some poor choices in what I just ate. <laughs> right. <laughs> but that's because I was, you know, depriving mm -hmm. myself from just like, you know, whatever it, whatever it is. <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> uh, one other thing that I, I always say to dancers is sometimes we don't realize how busy we are and how we're kind of like in that mode, like let's say nutcracker season where you're just like going and going, you're not really thinking about anything else. And before you know it, those two weeks are up and all those cravings hit you because like you said, maybe it was even an a somewhat unintentional restriction. You know what I mean? When you're super busy and you've got a lot going on and a lot of performances, um, it could it could be easy to not even think about honoring cravings. And then they kind of like slap you in the face <laughs> when Nutcracker's over. Of course, yes, of mm -hmm. course. Next, yeah. yes. <laughs> so what about uh, the pandemic? Did you feel like, did anything for you come about? Were there any challenges? Talk about that a little bit. Yeah, I mean, I think in the beginning, it was kind of a waiting game. And then just like many others, I was like, I'm going to be proactive. And I kind of reached out on Instagram and offered free private lessons oh, yeah. to um, dancers, students, um, oh. and a small donation if they wanted, gave back to my ballet company. Um, meanwhile, also slowly doing bar floor bar things to keep in shape but i also gave myself a bit of a schedule that wasn't too high intensity it was very like only twice a week and then worked out maybe like twice a week and mm -hmm. then i moved it to like three times a week because i knew that if i was five times a week like i normally do or whatever that was yeah. it, it you just burn out especially yeah. with no end date in mind because we were just waiting and you know, if someone said, oh, in two months, you'll start, that would have been maybe different. And I might have been able to do five days a week. But it was, you know, an endless kind of date that we were, whatever company you were in, right? Um, sure. when, when you were start. Um, so connect. So my main thing was like connecting with then students and people around, like, I mean, I think there was a private, an, a dancer that I did like in Germany that I had that was really okay. special and really cool. Yeah. And then connecting then to other studios who then asked me to do like a Zoom thing with like, you know, um, a group of dancers who obviously were in their home. Um, I am on a dance convention currently. So um, I do work and see like more competitive dancers versus like formerly classical ballet dancers. Sure. Um, but that was really great for me to then connect and um, work with kids that I haven't worked with before mm -hmm. um, and build these relationships, I guess. Um, also, s slowing down a little bit. Yeah. Um, I got to spend a lot of time with my boyfriend, now fiance. Yeah, I was, um, just gonna, I was gonna say, <laughs> yeah, congratulations. You oh, literally thanks. got engaged like a week ago. Yeah. <laughs> that's so, yeah. that's amazing. <laughs> thank you. Um, so, I mean, that was, I, I want to say that was like the highlight of it, honestly, right. because, um, and then we, on a personal side, um, moved into a house nice, um, yeah. and just having all that time with him that was unexpected was really incredible and special. Yeah. So. <laughs> awesome. My next question is uh, so easy for dancers to hyper-focus on dance. Um, well, actually, I'm going to break this up into two questions. Okay. Did you feel like you were um, more hyper-focused when you were in your years in LA? Or do you feel more hyper-focused in dance when you're in your ballet years? Um, and how do you stay balanced? And, you know, how any advice for dancers who are obviously, you know, as a dance student, just like so zoned in to the, to the point where it really actually negatively impacts them? Yeah, um, that's a really great question. I think that if I'm being honest, I was more hyper-focused when I was, you know, in a ballet company mm -hmm. versus LA because LA and the freelance world was a little, um, 
I think because it was all new to me, it was more mm -hmm. personally um, experimenting and guesting and trying new things and always traveling and teaching mm -hmm. um, and kind of just a waiting game and kind of with my agent seeing like what would come. And then in the ballet world, it's you know exactly what you're set up for and what your rep is. So I was very just like, okay, here's the end goal. Here's what mm -hmm. I get to do. Um, and then for the balance question, you know, that's something that I'm still um, trying to work on. I wish I had the answer, but I do tell I do tell a lot of my um, younger dancers, uh, students, to um, well, make sure you have a, one, at least one hobby outside sure. of, of dance and to try to have um, maybe one or two friends outside of uh, the ballet life. Um, yeah. Even if that's like, even if that's like a close cousin or um, it can be older, it could, you know, it could be um, an aunt or an uncle that you're really close with that you just spend time with and you're just not obsessing about dance or talking about right. what happened in the studio or, and even if you do want to talk about it, it's nice because they are removed from it and it's kind of more of a non-biased opinion but yeah. I think only having dancer or friends in the industry is again it's you know it's hard sometimes to reach out and have those connections but I do say if you can find a couple of those people it's really helped me um so yeah I think I I mean Alex my fiance he is so removed from it he sure. isn't in the arts and I will maybe be talking to him about it or something and he's yeah. like you're like he's like oh that's I'm I, you know I'll be so upset and he's like oh like that's not like you're that's fine like let go, oh, let, really? let that go you know totally. and I'm like oh yeah that you're right yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah totally like a third party perspective of course yeah but also by the way buying a house and having to decorate a house that's a I'm sure that brings in balance right into your life Definitely little projects, um, yeah. helping him with ideas, yes. um, a new space. It's always exciting. Mm -hmm. Ab <laughs> absolutely. So my final question for you, Jim, is how would you define what it means to be the healthy dancer? Yeah, and that's also another thing that I feel like I'm constantly working on. I think that yeah. you work on that until you're retired, right? But mm -hmm. I think healthy is number one, personal for everyone. Um, and I think that it it's more, when I think of a healthy um, dancer in terms of maybe not the food side mm -hmm. or their food choices, it's more right mental and yeah. emotional. And we have now opened up more of a conversation about mental health and things. And um, But it's really important because like we have, we've been talking about being obsessed or too obsessed. Mm -hmm. um, and there's so many different variables in the ballet world that kind of just can defeat us. Um, making sure we have balance and making sure that we um, have outlets that keep us, keep us not um, feeling like ballet is our only almost hope and that we only identify as a ballet dancer um, is really important. And um, because, yeah, I think mentally and emotionally, um, it's, you know, it's a difficult thing to um, live in this, in this industry. Um, so I think healthy is, you know, having some balance, um, being aware of your mental health, being aware of if you're going through a little bit of a, um, a journey, um, being aware of if you may be going through a bit of maybe depression, I've definitely experienced that, and being open to talk to someone or having some type of mentor or someone to talk to, it's good because being embarrassed by something um, and closed off, um, that in general isn't a healthy relationship for yourself. You know, and I think that it then projects onto other things that doesn't yeah. always come across um, in a malicious way, right? But um, it happens. And um, I think that 
we the more we have these open conversations about you know it's okay to not be okay for a little bit and say oh i need help or i need to talk to someone like that's that's being healthy that's not that doesn't mean you're mentally unstable <laughs> yeah oh my gosh i i can, couldn't agree more i mean just reaching out for support in order to sustain our not just our physical health but also our mental and emotional well-being is everything in regards to being a quote-unquote healthy dancer and I again couldn't agree more with the idea of everyone having their own definition of what it means to even be healthy right and that just not being um a unanimous thing everyone is their own individual person and uh really defines that for themselves yeah no it's um I think yeah and I think that when older dancers talk about it um, not saying that it's anyone's responsibility or obligation because that's something I talk about too. It's like you can talk about things in your own time and openly and if you're not ready to um, maybe talk about that, it's totally okay. But I think for those who are more open and professionals, it's a really great um, light to the younger generation who yeah. we all know is experiencing because they're going through this whole journey of just making it into the whatever industry it is, right? And then they get yeah. there and they think that they made it and everything's gonna be like better. But then they see that it's a cycle, but now they hopefully have had experiences that they've learned from, but it's just a new cycle and now they have to navigate it in a different way. <laughs> so it's like yeah, a lot. Absolutely. And honestly, having you professional dancers as a point of um, reassurance, as role models is just, everything for younger dancers it's, a, it's the whole reason why i have these conversations i love it i know <laughs> i think i every single you know dancer in older than me or in the professional line of this um ha, or my generation 30 and up maybe have said you know if we had some more of these in you know and i know social media is different than it was but even in like magazines right um just and having more dancers openly be able to talk about that um, yeah. would have helped our journeys a lot more. And um, yeah, which would have been a, a little bit different. So hopefully this younger generation is more um, um, aware and less embarrassed. And um, like you said, like when ready, like in need, seek, yeah. seek help and yeah. have a conversation about it. Absolutely. And one more thing I want to add to what you just said, um, the idea of social media, we didn't necessarily have it us millennials when we were like y dancing when we were younger, but Gen Z and the younger pop generations have it now it can be helpful, but it could also be problematic. And I think it's important for dancers to right know who they're following and follow accounts that are inspiring and helpful and not making you feel like crap. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I was off of social media for six months, actually. And Good for hard. you. It was hard for the first month because I felt like I was missing, like, like someone's, like, big promotion or, like, a proposal or, um, but it was really beneficial for me. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I even, like, ask myself when I go cross-train or work out, I'm like, am I working out because I'm, it's good for me and complements my ballet? And I like it because I do, after a workout, I feel better about myself and in, in my day and my body. Or am I doing it because I see some of these, like, really good-looking bodies, and I'm like, that's what I'm aiming to, to have. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's, and I'm, again, I'm an older dancer, so it's like I can't imagine, you know, like you were saying, like, the younger generation having to kind of compare and see that, but... Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And having those rechecks with yourself, right? Like asking yourself, why am I actually doing this? Am I doing it because it makes me feel good? Or am I doing it because I'm comparing myself to another dancer? Because that's not going to be helpful in the long run. Oh, yeah. Well, not. You'll just go down a dark hole really fast. <laughs> yeah. Well, Jim, <laughs> thank you so much for joining me tonight. Big congratulations to you. Oh, on your thank you. Minute. That is so exciting. You must still be on cloud nine. That's very yes. exciting. Yes. And thank you for, yeah, number one, having me um, and continuing these dance talks because I know a lot of people watch these back later and I've had so many people be like, oh, I watched, like three years ago, I watched your whatever and my daughter, yeah. you know, so it's yeah. really great that you're having these um, Absolutely. conversations. Absolutely. Well, thank you again for joining me and we'll definitely be in touch.